Um, I was a Muslim. I was born in Islam and in a Pakistani family in Britain, as you can tell obviously by my accent, I'm British. <laughs> um, the Lord Jesus began a good work in me and I know he's going to complete it until the day he returns. When I was a young Muslim, I have made myself some bullet points here so I don't forget and I because sometimes I ramble a little bit. Um, the Lord Jesus, this is how it all began in 2001. Uh, in 2001, basically, I used to read the Quran quite a lot as a young girl, as a young, young girl. And uh, I would read the Quran. I'm going to... There's some parts of my testimony that um, I'm just going to say it as as um, as I recall the the events. This was 18 years ago. <laughs> I basically began uh, reading the Quran and um, in Arabic, in the um, Quranic Arabic, when I was young. My dad taught me the Quran. He taught me how to read the Arabic in Quran, which is very common. With Muslim families, it's usually that we learn everything we do about the religion from our parents. Our parents are very key in our um, our growth in the faith. Um, so my dad taught me how to read certain verses in the Quran from a very young age. I would say probably from the age of five. That's how early we start, around age five. Age six, age seven, we had to memorize certain verses in the Quran. I mean, this is all in Arabic, not in English. <laughs> Muslims pray and they memorize scriptures in the Arabic. So, um, by the time I was in my teens, my late teens, um, early twenties, I was reading the Quran as I would always, always do in the um, Arabic, the Quranic Arabic. And then it would puzzle me because I wouldn't understand, wasn't able to comprehend exactly what it was I was reading. And this is often the case with many Muslims, is that we can memorize all the verses from heart, from memory. We have all these, the volumes and volumes of Arabic prayers and scriptures that we remember, like memorized. Um, but we wouldn't really know what it is that we were talking about. We didn't understand the language. It's like... Hebrew, like supposing that um, we know the Bible in all in Hebrew, but we don't really understand the meaning because it's not our dialect, is it? It's not our language. So uh, English is my first language. My parents speak Urdu, Punjabi in the background, um, but mostly at home it was English. So try to bear that in mind as I'm talking to you about what what it was about the Quran that I didn't understand because it was in Arabic. Eventually, I got to read the Quran in English because my dad gave me an English translation. <laughs> and then um, this is just, just bear in mind how the Lord Jesus works behind the scenes. When he knows the soul is really seeking the truth and we really truly are longing to know what the truth is. He's so faithful, you know. <laughs> um... Basically, the more time I spent reading the Quran in the um, in the English, because now I had it right in English, I would come across verses about Jesus, um, and I would compare him. This is the Jesus in the Quran, not the Jesus that we know in the Bible. So I would start to compare and contrast verses regarding Muhammad and Jesus, and I would question why. He died on the cross. I, I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense. The Quran didn't sort of... So it was like I couldn't find any answers in the Quran regarding this person, Jesus. He seemed so different, so special, really special, you know. Even in the Quran, you guys, imagine that. Imagine that there's a testimony of Jesus even in the Quran. Even though it's not the same, but it's it's a start, isn't it? That's how the Lord started on me. He started with the Quran on me. He sowed seeds in my in my heart. Um, eventually, I would, as you do, 
um, you know, like in street preaching, this is why I absolutely love and I'm so grateful for street preachers out there. So if there are any street preachers out there listening to me today, I thank God for your life. I thank God for your life, honestly. If it weren't for them, I don't know how long it would have taken the Lord to get me to believing in him. Street preachers, oh, there goes my pen, would um, pass by me in the street, literally, on the trains in London, public transport. These faithful preachers would be out there, you know, just handing out sort of, you know, tracts. You know, they would give you tracts and... Um, spreading the gospel basically and it, this all began to happen at the same time when I was seeking the Lord and really trying to understand Allah, Muhammad, Isa like I was really searching I was a very young girl um, a little bit about my personality at that time I was considered in my family this is just <laughs> it's amazing how God does it I was actually the rebel in my family. I was considered the scapegoat, um, the black sheep in my family. I'm the eldest of four, four kids. And um, I was the tomboy when I was young. So I'll go, go through all of that. And so in my 20s, this is when I started seeking God. Like in, in my heart, you know, I wasn't religious. I wasn't a religious Muslim girl. I was spiritual, you could say. I was really trying to find out who is Jesus? Like, why is he so different to Muhammad? What's so different about him? There's something about him. So I would keep these tracts, these amazing little gospel tracts, and I would keep them secret. I would keep them secret and keep them safe. Because in those tracts, there would be scriptures and the scriptures would have verses about why Jesus came and died on the cross. But then I would think, but the Quran says he didn't die. It wasn't Jesus who died on the cross. But these Christians are saying it was Jesus that died. <laughs> so that was a contradiction already, right? Later on, obviously, later on, I obviously found out historically it's proven. It's a proven fact. But at this early stage in my sort of because uh, I had a very inquisitive mind I was very curious I had no idea I had absolute zero theo theological understanding I wasn't very good with religion I didn't understand anything about Christianity or Islam to be honest only from the Quran everything I learned was from the Quran um, there goes my cat Fifi what are some of the things that the Quran shares about Jesus? Well, funnily enough, one of the verses, I don't have it right now because it's been a long time since I've been in that book, in the Quran. One of the verses in the Quran, um, which stood out to me, I don't know the number, I will find it. It says that Jesus is, um, he's the spirit of God and he's the word of God, that the word was in Jesus. Not only that, it also says that he did lots of miracles. So when I was reading these verses in the Quran, I was like, wow, this man was like, he had so much power. There's something really different about him. It just has, you just gravitate towards him, if I can put it like that. You know, if that's the appropriate word to use. Um, I made those comparisons, but eventually what happened was, I got to the stage where because of those tracks, because I didn't have a Bible at this time, um, the internet wasn't a big thing in those days. Just remember, this is 2001. 2001, I didn't even have a mobile phone. I never had a cell phone. <laughs> I had nothing. Um, it's not like today, you know. Um, so I would, I would read these verses in these tracks and I'll compare them to the Quran. And not only that, Remember, I wasn't like really studying things out from the Quran because I didn't have a Bible. But what I did do was that I would really talk to God. Um, I would talk to him. But the thing is, my God at the time was Allah. And my, I just, I could not draw near to him for some reason. Like he was so distant. And all I saw was blackness. Can I describe it like that? Blackness, just dark. I would even question things like, if 
if we're saying that we worship one God, right, one God, why is it that my dad, who would pray faithfully, he still does, why is it that the Muslims are bowing down before a rock like a stone, the Kaaba? I just, something about that whole thing never sat right with me, even as a Muslim. I was very hesitant to learn about the prayer because I, I, there was just something about the Kaaba, the black, the shrine in Mecca. Because remember, that's the prayer point. That's the focal point for all Islamic prayers. They pray facing um, Kaaba, Mecca. Like the Jews with Jerusalem, they face Jerusalem, you know. Muslims, they face Kaaba. So I would see this thing on the prayer mat all the time in my dad's room where he would pray. And I would just, oh, I don't know, it would just freak me out a little bit. I had a, a lot of pr um, problems with fear. I knew the spirit of fear was following me for many years as a little girl. I never liked being in the dark. Um, and for some reason, I just... <sighs> when Jesus, when those verses of Jesus would pop up, it would just do something you know, in here. I would just like, I wanted to know so much more about him, <laughs> but I wouldn't dare get a Bible. I didn't even cross my mind. Eventually what happened was I got to this stage where I began to believe the reason why Jesus died on the cross because this thing about him being the Lamb of God that these um, gospel tracts would talk about, they would say he's the Lamb of God. And he was sacrificed. He offered himself up and died for humanity, for all the world's sins. So I understood as a Muslim what sacrifice means. Literally an animal sacrifice because they do it as well, right? Because at Eid we would celebrate, um, there's two different types of Eid. One of them is where um, they commemorate Abraham offering Ishmael, not Isaac. And they don't really go into a lot of detail about that, what you know, why, the whys and all of this and that. Because remember, Muslims believe that they are the chosen people, not the Ish not the Isaac bloodline. They believe it's Ishmael. That's another thing. So when I came across this sort these scriptures about Jesus dying for the sins of the world, the Lamb of God, I was like, Oh, that makes so much sense to me. He gave me that understanding that I, I was I found it easy to believe. I was like, you know what? That makes so much sense. This is before, again, without having a Bible, right? So just through a few ha um, gospel tracks, I'm listening, I'm taking it all in, keeping them safe, snacking them in, you know. I would have a briefcase and I would hide them all in my briefcase at that time. As time was progressing, this is in the next coming months, um, I believed it. I believed it. I believed in the, the good news that Jesus Christ was God who came in the flesh, the word of God, because I had that testimony from Islam that he's the spirit of God, he is the word of God. And I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe I can believe on Jesus and still be a Muslim. But how will my family take this? I would have these, I would question a lot of stuff about it. I would like, oh my goodness, yeah, but can you imagine? I didn't know to the degree how bad it was, what I was about to do. I had no idea. I was naive. I was very naive. I didn't have any clue how bad the step I was about to take for, for the, my Muslim family, how bad they would take it. So I kept it a secret for five or six months. I would kneel in my bedroom. I would just sit there and pray and just talk to my Heavenly Father. <laughs> This was really like, I'm talking to the Heavenly Father. I would just sit and, and bow. One night, the night where I, I'd surrendered like to Jesus, his Lordship over my life, it was probably around three or four in the morning. I was waiting for everyone to be sound asleep. And I got out of my bed and I was in my bedroom and I bowed on the floor. I just, I felt like I need to be on my knees. So I was on my knees over my bed and I was just looking around like this, thinking, I'm going to come to the Father now in Jesus' name, in his name. Because according to these Bible gospel tracts, it says to do it in the name of Jesus. And so I did that. I don't remember the words. I don't remember the word for words, but I remember just saying, Father, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus, who became a sacrifice for my sins. 
I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Help me and my family to see you. Help us to know who you are. And I just... <laughs> It's like the the point that I'm crossing the line from the Mus from a Muslim girl to now be believing in Jesus. It's that breaking point, right? <laughs> and then um, after that time, you know, this sounds so cliche, you guys. I know it sounds cliche, but I'm telling you, I received the peace of God from that day onward. I did. He came. He came. His Holy Spirit came in my, and started to live in my heart. I know it. You know why? Because after this time, I just desired to get hold of the Bible. I was like, I need the Bible. I don't care. I need this thing. I need to read it. I want to know what Jesus wrote in there. So in the meantime, in the meantime, my baptism happens months later. It didn't happen straight away. In the meanwhile, I end up doing some temporary work in my employment for extra cash. Bear in mind, I'm still living with mum and dad and my siblings and everything. I'm the eldest daughter. Um, you know, so I'm keeping Jesus a secret. <laughs> I'm keeping him a secret because nobody needs to know it's a personal thing, right? Until the day comes when I get this job and I'm supposed to be helping the local community town hall and it was the general elections in the UK at the time and I was helping them with the ballots and everything and um, it's, it's a town in London called East Ham it's still there this town hall is still there and on my lunch break <laughs> on my lunch break because in my private time I confessed that Jesus is Lord in my private time, I had no, I didn't have no trouble with it. I knew he was God and eventually God would work it out. He would tell my family and, you know, he would save my dad and my mom. And I had it all worked out in my own brain <laughs> how he would do it. <laughs> this day, when I was at the, um, the town hall, I was doing my voluntary work. Not my voluntary, it was a paid job. I'm sorry, I was working there. During the lunch period, there was this um, Pentecostal, I think it was Pentecostal, there was this gathering of um, Colombian Christians in the town hall, in, in the venue where I was working at. And it was a Pentecostal gathering, and um, I, I went into the main hall, because I was, I was nosy, I was curious, you know, Sonia and curiosity. <laughs> I peeped in. And they were singing songs. They were singing songs. It was in Spanish, though, or the Colombian language. I wasn't sure, but I just had a good feeling. I just felt really good. So I walked in, and they were so excited. They thought I was one of them. They thought I was Colombian. So they said, come on in. I was like, oh, what's going on? You know, I thought it was a wedding. I thought they were celebrating a marriage or something. And then one of the girls, her name was Angelica, and she came over and she said, am I a Christian? And I said, huh? Am I? And I looked over my shoulder and I said, yes, I am. And she said, would you like to come in? Do you have your Bible with you? I said, Bible? I don't have a Bible. I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm actually working here. I'm on my lunch break. I was making all these excuses because I got nervous because I kept it a secret all this time. And she said to me, come over. And she went, she went and grabbed a Bible. And she gave it to me, it's this one here. This is the Bible. <laughs> she gave me this Bible. If I, I pray to God, I wish I could rewind and see this moment in history. I wish I could rewind. I just grabbed the thing from her and went, oh, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to just take it away and just go run off and go and sneak it in my handbag. I took the Bible from her and um, I stayed in the in the service. I was still there. And then what happened was the pastor, the preacher, he began to do what we call now the altar call. And so when the altar call was given, I was looking around like, what's going on? What's this? What are people doing? 
and then I saw one person, then another person, and they were walking up to the front, and you know, they were doing what you call surrendering their life to Jesus. And then I was like, oh, I really wanted to do this because I had to make the public confession. Because late, I know why now, because later on, when I started to read the Gospels, Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. But if you confess me before men, right? So now I know why I felt like I need to do this publicly. I need to like not be ashamed. So after a while, after a few minutes, I waited for the people to do their thing. And I just wanted to go there and just do it. Just go and I surrendered my life. I just did it without any... Um, I was nervous. I was nervous doing that because, again, um, I'm in a Muslim family. I'm considered still Muslim. And if anyone was to see me do that, they'd be hell to pay. So I just did it anyway. I thought I was in a safe environment and I knew God had set this thing up for me. He set it up so I would do it, you know. He gave me the Bible through this strange lady. He got me to confess and surrender, which is the right thing to do. You know, there's no such thing as secret believism in Christianity. No, no, no. We must boldly confess Jesus Christ. We must deny all false religion, deny idolatry and publicly do that and also publicly confess that there is only one God, there is only one name and that name is Jesus Christ. We must come to the place where we do that unashamedly, boldly. But at this time, I was still very timid. I was still very shy, very nervous about this whole thing because I was keeping Jesus a secret. Anyway, so shortly after this, this is the bookmark I got from that church at that time. I've kept it ever since. And um, this is the day I was, I done my, you know, I got saved, I guess you could say. Um, it was uh, the first, it was actually Saturday the 2nd, June 2001. So I'll never forget that day, I'll never forget it. Now, soon after this, um, I began to go home, read this Bible. I mean, oh my goodness, you guys, I wish I could really relay this to you. I was so hungry to read the Bible I had this, I didn't know where to start. I'm like, I don't know where to, where do I? So I'm flicking through. I see the verses of Jesus I read in the Gospels. So I'm reading those. I'm like, oh, but there's so much more. And my thing was, I really wanted to know about Abraham. Because my dad and I, my dad used to tell me that the Muslim faith, the roots are in Abraham. He would say something like that to me. That that's where it began. So the Quran never talks about that. It never says historically what was with the Abraham. What's the promise? Remember Abraham and Ishmael. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to go right to the very beginning of the Bible. And I started reading from Genesis. Now most people, when they come to Jesus, and I understand why, they go to the Gospels or they go to the book of John. Then they go to, I think it's Romans, right? And then they go to Hebrews. Is that called the Roman road, I think? But you see, I didn't have anyone help me. No, I didn't have anyone say, no, start here, I'll go there. So I just figured the best way to start a book is in the beginning, right? So I went to Genesis. I read the whole Old Testament. I don't know. It was in a couple of months, I think. It didn't take me long. It didn't take me long. I was reading this very Bible that I have today. In in between, I would go back to the New Testament and I would check things. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get to the New Testament. Hold on, Lord Jesus, I'm coming. And then I would go back to the Old Testament and read. I found it absolutely fascinating. The Bible. I was getting so many answers, you guys. So many answers from creation. Why Adam and Eve were created. What is the deal with Satan? Because of the Islamic thing about Satan doesn't make any sense. They, I'll, I'll, Maybe I'll talk about this another time. But the, the Islamic view of um, the devil in the early stages of creation is really peculiar. It makes no sense. Apparently, God told satan to bow down before adam and to like bow down like to worship adam 
But in Genesis, it says nothing of the sort. It's really weird. So when I was reading Genesis, I went over to the books of the law and um, I understood a lot from all the books of the law, which is Deuteronomy, right? All of that, Leviticus, it made sense because again, I'm coming from a Muslim background and it's very religious. They have a very religious um, works-based thing, right? They're very similar, very similar to what the Jews do and what Muslims do. There's a lot of similarities there anyway. So, in this time, I also discovered Christian TV on cable. <laughs> Christian TV on cable was there. And I would watch some of the channels in the early early hours in the night while my parents were, like, sleeping. I would come downstairs and I would turn on the telly and I would watch. Who would be on there? Derek Prince. I used to love Derek Prince's stuff. There were some preachers on there who are now, I remember like they they're prosperity preachers and i kind of like shied away from them a little bit but when i found Derek prince i learned so much from him i really did early on he started to sort of through the lord he was teaching me about demons but my heart was always about like where i wanted to focus was always on jesus like jesus christ you know i'm in love i mean i'm i'm in so i'm in love with jesus at this stage i'm so in love with him and it's like a fire, you know, Jeremiah says, you know, your word is like a fire. How can I hide it? How can I keep it a secret? It's burning in my heart. I can't keep it a secret. <laughs> These sort of things I would write in love letters to my heavenly father. I would write little poems, prayers. There were prayers. And I would keep these prayers in my bedroom. And I don't know, I, I would hide them. You know, like I'd have a... You know a prayer I would write and I would hide it to my Heavenly Father I didn't know how to express this love that he was giving to me I didn't know how to express it I was still in a Muslim family Muslim household you know we had Ramadan and I wouldn't keep I, I wouldn't wake up to fast with my family my mum started getting suspicious eventually she found my prayers I wrote to my Heavenly Father she found them and she also found my Bible. She found it falling out of my handbag one day. She comes to pick me up from the town hall. And this, this happened really rapidly. I mean, I'm talking about very quick, one thing after the next. Once my family found out, it was, oh my goodness. Um, my mum picked me up in the car and we were driving home and she asked me in the car, what? Do these letters mean who is my heavenly father and I was like what she found out she must have read them and she confronted me and I didn't say a thing I didn't say a thing and then she said you're not even keeping fasting why are you not keeping the fast on Ramadan I was like mm. I never said anything I was like really quiet and she started to get really upset, very aggressive. This is how the demonic works. It wasn't my mother, it was, it was demons. Demons in my mum getting irritated with me. She said, you're not even denying it. You're not even admitting to it. What is this? What are you up to? We don't call Allah our Heavenly Father. He's not our Father. And Jesus is not a son of God. And I was like, oh. It was just, okay, this is it now. This is, okay, right, it's just going to have to come out. I'm going to have to be prepared for this. She said to me in the car as she was beating me, my mum's driving the car and she's beating me at the same time. She's like, mm, mm. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, you know, or just taking her beats while I was in the car. She said, you better think this through before you come home today. I'm going to drop you off and think about this because I'm going to tell your father. I'm going to tell your dad. And you better reconsider. He's, he's not going to be happy. So um, I got really scared. I was like, oh my goodness, why is my mum making such a drama out of this? What, what can I do? I didn't want to say no. I, I never denied it. I didn't want to say, I, no, mum, you misunderstood me or anything. I was like, you know what, I'm just going to... I'm going to have to just do this thing, you know. Um, 
At the time, I was with my ex, my ex-boyfriend, and he wasn't supportive. He wasn't, he was seeing the transformation going on in my life, and he wasn't, he wasn't supportive of it. Um, in fact, he slapped me for believing in Jesus. He actually went and gave me a smack on the face because it offended him. That's another story, and that's probably irrelevant to this, but, um, I was... I was, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but Jesus Christ will pull you out. It will just pull you out. He draws you out with his light. You know that? Even though I was considered a scapegoat and the black sheep in my family, um, the taunts I would get just increased after this because when I went home, my dad did confront me. He said to me, is this true? Is this true? Your mum's been telling me these crazy things. I just want to ask you yourself, is this true? And I was like, I'd never said anything. I was, because I would fear my dad. I had so much respect for my dad. Remember, our culture, we just don't, you know, over here in the West, it's really like, <laughs> you know, we've got rights. You know, as adults, when you're 16, you've got rights, you know? You can tell your parents to shut it if you want. <laughs> But in my family home, the culture is very, um, what do you call it, shame and honour, really big deals in our culture. You can't just know dad. I was like, oh, dad, um, dad, you know, we can talk about this. I was very like, you know, and he was, he was fine. He wasn't aggressive with me. It was afterward, after this, what transpired. My mum ramped up a lot of the, um, the attacks against me during that time. She started to get all the family, the relatives to come over to talk sense into me. I would be upstairs in my room and then they would call me downstairs and just sort of interrogate me, you know? Interrogate me. Mind, mind you, at this time, I was only just at this time reading the Bible for myself and trying to understand exactly the, the history where Jesus came from, what's the background. So I was very young in the faith, literally a baby. I hadn't even been baptized yet. But my family, the relatives would be coming over, putting me on the hot seat and just asking me all these questions, really intimidating me. And I would just say, I know he's, he's God, he's the God of Abraham. And they didn't like that I would say he's the God of Abraham. I said, no, but he is, he's the same God. He's, I understand he's the same God because when when I was reading the Old Testament and jumping to the New Testament, there was a scripture that really, oh my gosh, it was amazing. I mean, there were so many, but there's this one verse. Because when I would read the Gospels, in um, I'm going to read you the Bible, I'm sorry. With my videos, you're going to get a lot of scripture. I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> I was trying not to read a lot, but here you go. Let the Lord have his way. I would read things like this. Check this out, you guys. In John 10, as a very new believer in Jesus Christ, literally just crossed over from being a Muslim, I would read in John 10 when it said, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And if you go on in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And if you continue, I am the good shepherd, it says verse 14, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. When I read this section in um, John, John 10, you know what? I remembered, I read that terminology before in the Old Testament. I was like, where did I read that about the Good Shepherd? Where is it? Because we didn't, I didn't use internet in those days. I had to go around all over the Bible, find it again. And I realized it was in Ezekiel 34. So I knew he was, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's all over the book. He is the God of the Old Testament. It's him. It's always been Jesus. Look at this, you guys. Um, Isaiah 34. I've got a bookmark of my family. Look. That's me. My sister, my brother, my youngest sister. I kept their pictures as a bookmark. 
Look, in Isaiah, this is why when I read the Gospel of John and it talked about I'm the Good Shepherd Jesus, I'm like, but he said it before. He said it in Ezekiel 34. That whole chapter is about the Good Shepherd, that God is the true shepherd. <laughs> and I know there ain't more than one shepherd, is there? How many shepherds are there? There's only one. It's him. It's Jesus. It's been him all along. And I knew that it was him who saw Abraham. God gave me this understanding straight away. I didn't have a problem with it. So this is what I was trying to tell my family. No, he is the God. He's the one. He's the main one. He's created everything. And it says, I said, Dad, don't you agree? In the Quran, it says Jesus is coming to judge the world. Muhammad isn't coming to judge the world, is he? He's dead. And I would, that's when I would get slaps on my face for saying that.